This is the Music Therapy Chronicles podcast interview with Casey Soros. I think that you know, something for all therapists to do is like, take note of those moments when you really do feel like you're in your calm and safe state your body and just try to incorporate more of that into your day. Um, I think it's an important thing for us to constantly be doing. You're listening to the Music Therapy Chronicles, a podcast about music therapy from a variety of perspectives. Our ambition is to inspire and connect listeners through meaningful conversations, just like a music therapy conference you can listen to anywhere. My name is Trisha Coyote, and I am a board-certified music therapist from the New England region. If you like what you hear, join our group on Facebook and share your own insights and thoughts about the episodes. You can also connect with us on social media and online at Music Therapy Chronicles. Welcome back to the Music Therapy Chronicles. I hope you're having a great day and you're feeling excited for part two of my conversation with Casey Soros. If you haven't listened to part one, please go back and check it out. It was an awesome conversation. Uh, And if you did listen to part one, you know that this is kind of just where um, my mind's been at lately with with the book club I'm I'm doing and with conversations like this and uh, in all honesty my caseload has shifted a bit where my focus needs to be more on trauma informed care and and keeping this mindset and this um, perspective when I'm going through the day to day grind because uh, sometimes it can feel like a grind right and this is the conversations like this reground me in why what I'm doing is important and how to keep showing up as the best person I can be as well as the best therapist I can be. So I hope that regardless of what your day-to-day work looks like, um, you're feeling inspired by this as well as informed and um, in a way invigorated. Uh, In last week's conversation, there was a point where I said, how Lucky are we to be able to witness, you know, these hard moments with our clients and and to be there with them and to bring that, bring that hard moment back to a safe reality. Um, And in the moment, it doesn't always feel like that. Sometimes it feels really hard, but that's, that's a reminder I keep giving myself. So I hope that, um, I hope that resonates with you today as well. So thank you for clicking on the show, for being with us today. If you're not already subscribed, please subscribe. There are over 100 episodes available to listen to and more coming. If you feel so inclined to leave us a rating and review, I would so appreciate it. That really helps the podcast be more visible. Also, I always forget to say this, but... If you're listening to the show and loving it, please share it with a friend, share it with a colleague, and uh, take a screenshot and tag us on social media. We're at Music Therapy Chronicles on all the platforms, and I'd love to see what episode you're listening to, to hear your thoughts. If you want to start or join a conversation to dive into these topics deeper, you can join the Music Therapy Chronicles Facebook page. I'd love to see you in there. Um, If you are looking for some community support and some self-care support, stay tuned for the Music Therapy Chronicles self-care community that will be launching shortly. There is a link in the show notes to get on the wait list, so you'll be the first to know when that opens. I can't wait to welcome our first group of members and to kick off that launch Uh, I will be hosting a 14-day free self-care challenge here on the pod, um, on social media, and in the email. So make sure you get on the newsletter, you follow us on Instagram, and you subscribe to the show so that you don't miss any of that. Uh, I hope to see you 
in the self-care challenge so we can all kind of take a couple couple weeks to reset for the last part of the year I don't know about you but this year still feels like last year which felt like the year before that but it's still important that we put some focus on ourselves take some time for ourselves and practice self-care and doing that in community is so impactful all right enough on that let's get into this conversation with Casey So tell us um, the difference between neuroception and perception. Oh, yeah, neuroception. So neuroception, okay, let me talk about perception first because I think that's something we all know. Perception, you know, we have an awareness to ourselves. We can perceive something, there's awareness to it. Um, Perception is important when we're thinking about maybe why a client is having a certain response um, and maybe we're not sure why. Um, So I'll give an example. Say somebody has been in a, actually I'll give a real life example. Um, This is a a colleague of mine was telling me this. Um, She was working with a client and he would just have these random outbursts every once in a while when she would see him. And she knew that he loved music therapy and it was kind of hit or miss. Like some days she would go see him and everything was fine. And then there would be, you know, days where she would come and instantly, you know, he would go into this full blown like panic mode. She started kind of like noticing the pattern that every time she wore the color red, um, yeah, every time she wore the color red, he would have a meltdown. Um, and it's one of those things with this client where the trauma history is a little fuzzy. We don't really know what the background story is. But after piecing together some things, um, we think that there was abuse, um, you know, with this individual. And it could be very possible that the person who abused that client was wearing the color red. We don't know. But once you stop the color red, totally like meltdown stopped all of that so the point of that is that you know the color red was obviously a trigger um and even though he knew that his music therapist was a safe person his autonomic nervous system was neurosing danger Mm. um because he saw the red because we can speculate that an individual in the past abused him and was wearing the color red so it basically just explains why we why we go to our different fight or fight or free states um, without really understanding why. And it's usually because there's something that we're accepting in our environment as dangerous, though we might know cognitively, logically, that we are okay and we're safe. Okay, so when we know cognitively we're safe, but our body goes into a different autonomic response, that's neuroception. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's yeah. Our, our body neurocepting danger. Wow. Yeah, yeah. I never had a word for that, but I have experienced that before where I was mm-hmm. in a situation that I knew was safe, but my body was in, I was in freeze. <laughs> and I remember like talking with a person and I was like, I- I'm in freeze right now and I-, I-, I don't know why, but I am. Right. So it's yeah. like, awesome to have a word for that. Neuroception. Mm-hmm. Yeah, neuroception, yeah. Yeah. Oh, and so cool that um, that colleague figured out that it was the color red, because that's one of those right. variables that's like, is it the room? Is it the time of day? Is it the cycle of the moon? Like, right, you're exactly. tracking what you wear every mm-hmm. day. Right, right. And something, yeah, something so small, you know, it's not something mm-hmm. that I would even think about. <laughs> it's like, what, what am I wearing today? Um, but yeah, it's so fascinating how something so all and so what we would consider simple um you know can can make our bodies grow into perceived neuroceptive danger I guess yeah yeah oh I want to okay so I'm going to tie this back to harm again because that's just where I'm going (laughs) is you know again so trauma-informed right 
instead of just seeing like, well, there's no pattern to this. They're just getting upset. Like something is triggering them and has very little to do with me, which sometimes that's the case. You know, this this person that you, this colleague you have was able to like really look at it and be like, no, something. It's right. something. And, and yeah. I am thinking of a certain student I have and he also loves music, but coming into the room is a fight every and i'm mm. sorry to use the word fight but like you know every time something about the room and i i still haven't figured it out um i think it has more to do with the room than it does to do with my clothes but now i'll pay attention to that so it's like <laughs> you know what like what about this particular room what is it like mm-hmm. you know and then then you get into things like well it's a room in the school that's open and it's convenient and like you know, it's like, so where do you, where do you outweigh? Like, Hey, this room is open, right. it's convenient, it has a piano, but it's upsetting for him to come into the room. So like, do we just get past the five minutes of upset or do we find another room that's available? Right. Right. And it's, it's hard because everybody's so different and, you know, um, yeah. Uh, unless the individual is able to tell you, you know, specifically too, it can be really hard to pinpoint what that is. And so, you know, just like trying out different things and trying to see, okay, what, what moments am I noticing calmness Mm -hmm. and groundedness in this client? And when am I noticing these really heightened, um, you know, and just almost like tracking data I guess yeah. <laughs> so going back to our, data. our data collection yeah I, I mean I think that's more important you know trying to figure out you know okay these are the moments where this client I notice calmness and groundedness and they're really feeling safe and they're playing with their friends and you know what's happening in their environment where this is going on and then you know trying to pick up on those patterns and that's that's hard it's really hard for us to do because sometimes it happens mm. in you know, point two seconds. We're not, we're not always able to catch it, but yeah, once we can catch it, though, I think, you know, I, that's a big responsibility to always figure out every single client's triggers, and I, I don't think that's something we can always do. We see too many people in a week, mm-hmm. <laughs> and you know, that's a lot of, that's a lot of pressure. But I think when we are able to pinpoint those triggers, and we are able to figure out what's causing our clients to nerve that's when it's our responsibility to make sure that when we are with them we're and resolving those dangers to the best of our ability um, so that we're not causing that harm for the client what a great advocacy um, piece for qualitative research versus quantitative research yeah because I feel like you know maybe this is just my personal experience but a lot of the times qualitative research is like or qualitative data you know people don't necessarily look at it but if I said like hey I realized that every time I wore a red shirt this happened right. and so I have in theory fixed the problem <laughs> by no longer wearing a red shirt and like how right. happy would everyone be that I have fixed the problem exactly uh, even though I don't Sometimes have a graph to show it <laughs> right Exactly. Yeah. No, some we need the concrete data to yeah. talk about. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Do you want to tell us about your um, CMTE course? Sure. I would love to. Um, yeah. So I have created a six credit CMTE course approved through CBMT. Um, and it's self guided. So you uh, will receive get six or seven videos. I can't remember. Receive videos and some supplemental reading materials that go along with the videos. And basically, it's just me kind of talking um, about this stuff. Uh, broken up to, to the different parts of trauma, uh, what the polyvagal theory is, what it looks like when an individual is stuck in their autonomic nervous system. Um, we can help our clients become unstuck. And then I think the final part is like creative applications and therapy that I've personally used um, based off of all the information that I know. So yeah, that's like the nuts and bolts of what the course entails. And then, um, yeah, you just create uh, 
complete the, I think there's two assignments at the end of each part and submit it at the end. And then I give you a nice little certificate saying, did it. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. I've gotten some feedback from people who have taken it and so far it's all been positive. So I think it's been a really um, good course for people to take who are just simply interested in learning more about trauma. There's a little bit about somatic experience in it um, and a lot about the polyvagal theory and the autonomic nervous system. Yeah, what a great resource. I will I will have that linked in the show notes so people can find it. Awesome. That's great. Cool. Is there anything else you want to touch on before we move into the rapid fire? I don't think so. This has been a lovely conversation. And um, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Agreed. Yeah. I like I said, I've been having lots of conversations like this based on the book club, you know, but that's like the grounding piece. But I right. think that it's important, um, having read this book several years ago and then coming back to it, it's been a very important reminder because my perception of all of this information <laughs> has changed over the years between my reading that. So um, it's important to have conversations like this to, to reground in this trauma-informed mm -hmm. care, the reminders of what we're doing. and Because it's so easy, like you said, we work with so many people to just get caught up and like there are some days where you know you're looking at something that's being triggered by a trauma and like you're looking at it and you've had a rough day yourself but it, or I'll speak for myself I'm looking at it and I'm like defiance there's so much defiance right I need, to, mm -hmm. I need to stop myself and be like no Trisha take a breath like it's yeah. not about you right so having conversations like this is important to to keep us grounded in this I was going to say, and, and it's all the more reason why, you know, when I talk about this stuff, I talk a lot about it from the perspective as the therapist working with the client, but we need to be doing our own work. Yes. As therapists. You know, we need to make sure we're taking care of ourselves. And, you know, I touched on this a little bit, making sure we're staying grounded and connected and really taking care of ourselves, you know, making sure we're taking care of our nervous systems and our bodies outside of therapy so that when we are with our clients and maybe in those more difficult moments, we can truly be present and be there for them in the most helpful way possible. Um, and yeah, another thing I wanted to touch on too is that we didn't learn about this stuff in school. Like I didn't, <laughs> I mean, the polyvagal theory is relatively new for therapists to be learning about in general. I think mean, this is something I would have learned about anyway, but um, you know, conversations I think are important because it's a lot of people just kind of learning stuff on their own and it's not really things that, you know, students being taught or that we're learning about in, um, you know, our formal educational settings necessarily. So just talking to people who have these different backgrounds, I think it's a really important way for us to constantly learn and grow as therapists. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to, take a step back what are some of the ways that you ground yourself you know do the work yourself to, to keep <laughs> to keep yourself honest for lack of <sighs> yeah I think going back to when I was introducing myself at the beginning like mm. I I don't get a little bit of outdoor time each day I think I would probably go a little extra crazy so mm. you know for me for me it's like just those simple things like I have to mirror in the morning my me time like I have my morning routine where I have my coffee you know sitting on the porch um just you know taking time for myself and um you know at night usually winding down with a good book or something like that so for me it's you know I'm very introverted and I need that time to really recharge um on my own and so doing those sorts of things you know just helps around me um so yeah I think that's you know, something for all therapists to do is like take note of those moments when you really do feel like you're in your calm and safe state in your body and just try to incorporate more of that into your day. Um, I think it's an important thing for us to constantly be doing. Yeah. Take some data on yourself and implement that. Exactly. Love yeah. That. Yeah. Okay. Are you ready for the rapid fire? I think so. All right. The first question is coffee or tea? Oh, coffee. Hand down. <laughs> <laughs> I 
I feel like coffee people always have the answer ready where tea uh, people are like, oh. <laughs> I tried really hard to give up coffee and drink more tea and it just, it, it did the opposite effect. Now I'm like even more addicted to, <laughs> to coffee than before. So yeah, definitely coffee, I find but nothing too, you. nothing too fancy. Like just coffee with like maybe a little bit of all milk in it. That's all I need. All right. Early bird or night owl? Um, oh, gosh. It depends on the day. On the weekends, night owl, weekdays, early bird. I like to get up and run early in the morning on the weekdays, but weekends I tend to get late and sleep in. Something you'd tell your younger self? Mm. Oh, that's a tough one. I would say to be the friend that you are to people to yourself as well. Hmm. To be kind to yourself. Yeah. I like that. Your music therapy elevator speech. Oh, gosh. <laughs> I think... Um, usually tell people that I use music to work on non-musical goals and really to work with my clients on whatever goals that they have um but using music as the vessel um or the main component in the session but also silence too so yes <laughs> so the silent music therapist. Exactly. <laughs> Lovely. Your favorite self-care practice. Uh, sorry, you got choppy there. What was that? Your favorite self-care practice. Ooh, favorite self-care practice. Um, I don't have an exact answer for that. It's really more lately than being more intuitive in the moment and listening to when I need to rest or if, you know, sometimes self-care for me means that I need to go do laundry or, <laughs> you know, um, do whatever work around the house that needs them. So I think it's actually been taking a moment to pause and really focus on what I actually need versus what, you know, what do I think I need to do for self-care right now or, you know, versus what I, what do I actually need for self-care? So is it safe to say your self-care is having a somatic experience? Yes, I think it would be. I think, I think there's a little bit of somatic experience on myself happening in those moments, yeah. <laughs> yeah, love that. Something that's currently adding value to your life. Mmm adding value to my life another one I would say so I kind of took like a reading hiatus for some reason like just I don't know things felt like a chore um but, and because I gave myself a break from reading uh I've been enjoying it again so I have um a couple books that I started um Oh, and also, I think now the other thing, um, you know, going on hike and starting to notice the, the fall colors, mm. that's been very, I don't know, lovely uh, for my mental health. Yeah. Yeah. It's refreshing, the change in mm -hmm. seasons. Exactly. Like, yeah. Your favorite intervention or song to use in a session? Mm. Intervention or song. I would say favorite intervention would probably I don't know. I have so many clients who are creative artists outside of just using music. So anytime, you know, I'm able to use imagery with a client with, you know, drawing or um writing you know some other creative element i would say uh that's 
that's when I feel like I'm in my element as a therapist. Yeah. Oh, that's beautiful. The last one is where can the listeners find you and connect with you? Sure. Um, so my email address is ksorosmtc at gmail.com. Um, I have a like, therapy Instagram account you can follow called Chromatic Somatics. Um, <laughs> I also have like, a little blog that I started that was another like, pandemic hobby. Um, I think if you just Google Chromatic Somatics, it's like a WordPress blog. Um, and I've written a couple of articles that are on there. And that also is where um, people can enter the EMT course as well. Um, so those, those are the best ways to find me. Cool. I will have all of that linked in the show notes so that people can can easily access all of that. And thank you Great. for all the work you're doing and, and putting this information out so that we can we can learn about it. Yeah. No, I love it. This is definitely a passion of mine. So I enjoy it. Thank you. Thank you for having me on and talking about this kind of stuff. This is great. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks for making the time to be on the show. I enjoyed our conversation and uh, I know the listeners are going to learn a lot. Um, Well, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. You do the same. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this week's episode. I hope you enjoyed this conversation and um, check out all the links available in the show notes to dive into these topics some more. We can all, we we all make an impact every day, right? We, We do that through our work and continuing to grow as professionals especially in this area right now, I think we all um, will increase our impact tenfold. Yeah, I really feel that and I hope you do too. If you are loving the show, please let us know by writing a rating and review. I so appreciate that. Don't forget to follow us on social media and online at Music Therapy Chronicles. Hop on our newsletter Uh, You can find that at musictherapychronicles.com. If you listened to last week's episode, you know that if you're searching Music Therapy Chronicles in Google, you're likely only going to get a link to the RSS feed, which is just like a page of code. So please, if you're going to the website, go to musictherapychronicles.com directly. Uh, And if enough of us do that... (laughs) (laughs) then Google should figure out what's going on and fix the problem. So please, please, please help me out with that. Um, And yeah, you want to be on the newsletter, so you will be the first to know when the self-care community opens. Uh, I'd love to see you in there. If you're looking for another way to support the show, you can become a patron on patreon.com. Subscribing is one of the best ways to support the show. And you can check out our pod courses that are available on mtpodcastcollective.com. There's also several other podcasts that have pod courses available on there. So check those out if you want CMTEs for listening to the show. And finally, if you or someone you know is interested in being on the show, please let me know by sending an email to hello at musictherapychronicles.com. Our quote this week comes from Molly McCulley Brown in her book, Places I've Taken My Body. The truth is, I want the same things so many activists work for. I want a different better world than the one I came of age in. Each child with a disability will always know too early the dictionary of defects and treatments essential to her life. But I want for them all to have, too, another language with which to talk about their bodies and their lives, one of pride and complexity, intimacy, and particularly survival and triumph. (laughs) 